Okay. Yeah, so I'd like to talk about a bunch of things that sound scary, which are which we listed, which are motives, zeta functions, lambda rings, and the big wit ring. But you know, somehow it's all supposed to say it again. Uh, there were four of them, right? Lambda <laughs> rings, the big wit ring. ring. Those are already connected. Yeah. And then motives. Yep. And data functions. Data functions. And motives and zeta functions are also. Yeah, they're very strongly well, connected. They are, but I, I don't understand nearly enough, nearly well enough what motives are, but nevertheless, okay, but go ahead, yes. Yeah, one, so one good thing about this business is that it doesn't depend a whole lot of, on what motives are. Um, yeah, so, I mean, in some ways I can understand them a little bit abstractly, so. Yeah, so we'll there's some, so we just need a category with some properties and I'll call it a category of motives and all, but what matters is just a sort of limited set of properties of it. And so the idea okay. is that if you have a category with some nice properties, <clears throat> then you can define a zeta function for any object in that category. And it will sort of match familiar zeta functions, for example, uh, how, vari how varieties of varieties. So varieties should be special examples of motives and motives are some one of the categories that has this structure that lets us define zeta functions. So you can define a zeta function of a, of a motive. But, but I mean, the point is, the good point is that we don't need to know a lot of details about any of that stuff. <laughs> I'm not. A tr I'm not all sure how you feel about this yet. Uh, about the idea of defining a concept of zeta function in this particular generality. But okay. But go ahead. Yep. So right. I mean, I so, you know I know some contexts where there's a really good reason for defining uh -huh. what a zeta function is. So I'll have to see how, how it goes in this case. Okay. Go ahead. Yep. So. It's probably good to start over at the lambda ring and big wit ring side. For some reason, I say wit instead of bit. Um, sure. Probably bit. Um, so, so what order did you list them in? <laughs> I'm realizing I'm trying to take my notes here. Go ahead. Okay, lambda rings and big wit rings are what I'm going to talk about now. Okay. Okay, and go ahead. So, so the way I like to think of it is this. So if you have a, so if, so if R is a, is a two rig and, I, and the kind that, gosh, my, my, my screen doesn't seem to work very well here. Something bad's going on. Uh -huh. uh, I'm gonna turn off my, Video. Okay. It's as if my computer is like so slow it can't keep up with my handwriting. It's really weird. Right. So, so if R is what you like to call an absolute two rig. Okay. Um, and I guess I want to be like over. So that's some. I'll say, <laughs> I'll say remind everybody else what that is, but over a field of characteristic zero, which I won't keep talking about. Um, I have to make sure I understand what that means, but uh, okay. So, so, okay. Yeah. so what, so what is this thing? So it's a, so it's a K linear. Oh, this is really bad. K linear um, symmetric monoidal uh, 
um, Cauchy complete category. So, um, so the symmetric monoidal this has to interact well with the k linearness so it's like a it's a symmetric monoidal yes guy in the two category of vect enriched categories enriched over the where the vect is vector spaces over k yeah and cauchy complete as you know is is such a nice uh property such a nice property that the tensor product automatically distributes over the those absolute co-limits. So yeah, that sounds reasonable. Further niceness for that. Um, so yeah, so, so Todd and Joe and I wrote a bunch of stuff about, about these absolute two rigs. Yes. And, and so one of the upshots which people sort of knew already, although maybe not in quite this much generality, is that, is it, so you can form this Rothendieck group of, of this. And Rothendieck group, I guess there's even like some ambiguity in what people mean by a, a Rothendieck group. But th so this is like, first you, first you take the, isomorphism classes of objects. And then you, uh, the set of isomorphism classes of objects, and then you make it into an abelian group. Well, sorry, you, 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 you make it into a commutative monoid using direct sum. And then you turn that commutative monoid into an abelian group, uh, like group completing it. So, so I just to get it out of the way. I mean, there are like some people who like to find exact sequence. Uh, yeah, exact sequence K theory, but we're just doing direct sum K theory here. Right. Right. Um, okay. So, so that's this kind of then, perhaps goes along with the absoluteness, perhaps to some extent. But go ahead. Yeah. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I guess we wouldn't quite know what to do, except this. If that's true. Yeah. Well, it'd be sort of a little scary if they didn't have. If it wasn't something that where short exact sequences were but well behaved, that might be a little scary otherwise. Yeah. So this thing is a so it sort of obviously is like it's a commutative ring where the tensor product in the in R turns into the multiplication in the in this growth and D group. Very plausibly at least. Okay. Yeah, I mean, so the the tensor product distributing over the direct sums gives you the distributive law ultimately in in here, and so on and so forth. Yeah, um, and I think I've been yeah sort of turning into a fake algebraic geometer, so I will st stop saying commutative. Okay. Uh, just like I did. <laughs> right. Uh, right. And okay, but then the point is the point is that it's better than just a commutative ring. It has more right. structure always. Um, and uh -huh. so so I mean, without saying yet what this means, I'll just just drop it out here that it's actually a lambda ring. Um, and so in some sense, lambda ring is the concept designed to make this sentence true. Although we haven't, I guess, exactly proved quite that theorem that I'm hinting at. There should be like some theorem that says like exactly what structure do you always get on the growth and deep group of a absolute two rig. And I'm pretty sure that it's just exactly the structure of a, being a lambda ring. But I'm not going to try to prove that that's, or right. I'm not going to, I don't know that that's all the structure you ever get, but I know right. you always get that structure and right. probably all you get. 
So, um, so the way I don't want to, yeah. So I don't want to sink into this stuff, this side of things too much, but I don't want to sink into it too little either. Uh, so I want to say like just a little bit about what, what is a Lambda ring. Um, so you, you said in email a bunch about what a Lambda ring is. Yeah, um, I, I think I have a pretty, I think I could force me to give some definitions. I could give you some definitions, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you also said in email, you mentioned uh, uh, I, I, this ancient uh, terminology where a Lambda ring was originally only half of a Lambda ring and then there were special Lambda rings. And then they realized they preferred those enough that they started calling those lambda rings or something like that. Right. Yeah. I mean, you, you made it sound like the original lambda rings might turn up in the story somewhere. Um, only in some annoying aspect of the story that I'm going to try to not tell. <laughs> okay. Okay. So there's like something. Yeah. When I learned about this stuff, there was some thing that people were hoping thing was a lambda ring and it turned out to be just one of these defective lambda rings yes. which these days by the way they seem to call a pre lambda ring so they've sort of knocked knocked up the knocked the notation up a notch so that the old special lambda rings are now just lambda rings well i mean it's it's something that you can do with any plethora right you can always talk like a about a half model of a plethora um, yeah okay so you're starting to you're starting to make me yeah, you're starting to lure me into uh -huh. saying more about this, um, which I didn't really want to. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Go ahead. It's okay. It's either way. Uh, sort of okay. Yeah, no, so you can, either way. So the main thing is that there's this there's this category that we call the category of that I'm going to call sure the category of sure functors, um, and what as a category, one way to think about it is it's just uh, is it's just the category of of functors from the groupoid of finite sets um, to finite dimensional vector spaces. Uh, but are, that are very finitistic. Wow, it's really bad. My, my notebook just doesn't seem to work anymore. So Did it, it just suddenly started? Yeah, like a few sessions ago, it seems to have like, uh -huh. I think they keep like making Zoom more high powered and they like, it sucks more and more resources out of Could be. my computer. That's my only theory. Uh -huh. So it's functors from the group void of finite sets. To, yeah, you, you make it sound like you're trying to establish exactly the right kind of functorial fin finiteness for your purposes. Yeah. Um, so, may, 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 I mean, I'd sort of like you to settle that issue by saying what yeah. the universal property is. Uh, I mean, it's it, it. Yeah. Well, I could do that. Yeah. I I, I mean, I mean, it's that. probably it's probably the obvious thing, right? So you're not asking for you're only asking for finite direct sums to exist, only asking for, right, only asking for the, yeah, 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 it probably is the obvious thing, the universal property. Yeah. By the free... So these are the most, yeah, so these are the most, these are the most finite kind of things. So they're, sorry, this is your yes. stupid way to say it, like the dimension of all these FNs. Sure. Adds up to a finite number. Um, so each one is finite dimensional and there's finitely many non-zero ones. The, yeah, well, since, since, since I wrote this huge paper with <laughs> Joe and Todd about, about this stuff, I could like go on endlessly, but, um, but like one, I mean, the way you've written it, you've, the way you've written it there, it looks like the three Absolute two rig on one object. Exactly. Yeah. So it's the this is the free two rig on one generator, and then like a and sort of into that fact, 
is that like there's this forgetful functor from two rigs to um, to just categories. And the 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 thing of of uh, endo transformations of that and like endo modifications of that <laughs> um, that that is sure. So this is like this kind of. I always associate this fiber factor. What? Yeah, I always associate this idea with Levere or something, probably because you like talked about Levere as like the natural structure or theory of something. I don't know. Or maybe some people would call it like a, a crying idea where you have a yeah, some kind of forgetful functor and then you look at all the this is a forgetful two functor, and you look at all the and the morphisms of that. You oh, sorry. Maybe I made, maybe I made a level up here. Sorry. Maybe I made a level up here. Say, so, um, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Maybe I screwed up here. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry. I think I made a level up there. So, okay. So you were saying something different. You were saying that this two functor. So one way to think about it is this is like if you give me a give me a sort of anonymous two rig, what endo functors can I define on it that are natural or actually pseudo natural, and those are the, just the sh called the sure functors. Yeah, and so they consist of things like you can take an I guy in a two rig and you can tensor it with itself a bunch of times. And then you can like take a, you can symmetrize or anti-symmetrize that tensor product. So for example, you can take any Young diagram and that will give you an, an endo functor of a two rig in this pseudo natural way. And you, we show that that's like, well, and you can get direct sums of such functors uh, so in other words, and, and young diagrams are just some explicit sort of basis of this thing called sure here. Uh, yes, yes. As you know, yeah. So, well, so I guess the easy part of the theorem is that like, if you have a, sh a guy in this, a guy in this category here, you can s see how it would act on a, on something in any two rig. It's like a polynomial and you can just like apply that polynomial to an, an object in a two rig. It's like yes. a categorified polynomial. But then like the harder part of the theorem which Todd showed was that, that you can start with any, uh, anything in the, any of these pseudo natural transformations and show that it comes from, from uh, a guy in sure, but the way the reason why it works is what you said. It's ultimately, I mean, there's a, it's a long argument in a way, but one of the key reasons is that sure is the free two rig on one generator. So, right, right, sort of what makes it tick. Right, right. Um, this is already more getting into this more than I. <laughs> yes, I yes. Uh, but so, but one thing that's like. Uh, well, okay, but I seem to be, ah, I seem to be, seem to have gotten, seem to have gotten myself pulled into it a little bit. So, okay. Um, so there's a, so, so we get this like map from, from this thing I'm calling sure to like R comma R where R here is any two rig. So R bracket R, I mean the, the uh, endo functors. 
from R to R, the maps from R, functors from R to R. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, wait a minute, <laughs> what's the feeling here? Um, so th that is for each particular two rig, we get one of these things. And then it's natural, it's a, it, well, that, that's coming from, that's coming because the objects of sure are these kind of. Sorry, I'm confused. I, I thought you were just saying we're getting a, a map from a, a functor from sure to R. Well, so, okay, no. what do square brackets R here? That means like fun functors from one category to another. So, so every sure functor gives you an endo functor on any particular two rig. Uh, let me think. Let me think. Oh, oh, okay. R is a two rig. Okay. Let me think. 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 I'm just getting disoriented here. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That sounds right. Yeah. 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 So that's. That's one way to think of what's going on. And then there's this other way that you seem to be hinting at, uh, so which makes me hard, have trouble resisting uh, mentioning it, which is that there's this plethora way of thinking about it where you, yes. there's, there's a kind of plethism product uh, so you can curry this it lets you curry this thing and think of it this thing this way and so we're here what we're using is the fact that sure is actually a by to rig <laughs> and there's this tensor product of of by two rigs and sure is actually a mono monoid in by two rigs, which is, which we call a two plus three. And so it's, so this is like another way to think of how the action works. Uh, and I wasn't trying to, <laughs> I wasn't really trying to get into this so much, but um, it is. Yeah, I, I know more about, as usual, I know more about categorified plethories in the, total case than in the absolute case, but I, uh -huh. you know, it's plausible. A lot of what you're saying is plausible for this absolute case, but okay, go ahead, yeah? Yeah, yeah, so we wrote a bunch of stuff about the, about the, this absolute case. Um, and so part of why I'm mentioning that, or maybe the only reason I'm mentioning that, uh, is that we can apply, we can apply the Grothendieck group construction, K, to this, map here and, to, and sort of decategorify this map. Um, and that's that's sort of where la that's sort of where the lambda the sort of classical oh, I don't know, lambda ring idea comes from. So we have to actually sweat a bit to to prove this, but it's at least vaguely plausible maybe that you can you can take the growth and deep group everywhere. And so these guys now, all these K of guys, these are all rings now. So they have been two rigs and now they're just rings. And, and sure had been a <laughs> two by rig. And now this thing is a by, a by ring. Right. Um, it's a ring. And, and actually sure had been a, a monoid <laughs> into by right. Rings. And so or pseudo monoid, if you want to be super precise. And so now, now it's a, so now it's a, like a monoid. Well, you have to, it's amazing. We actually have to work a bit to prove this stuff. I mean, it's like not quite falling off a log. Uh -huh. But I don't. I don't want. To, that's what I don't want to worry about. So, right. 
So it's a monoid in bi rings, which is called, which is what's called a plethory. Yes. Um, so it's acting on, on the K theory of any two rig. And this, and this thing, K of sure, that's what, that's what a lot of people call lambda. Um, so it's a thing that has a basis. It, it, it's, a, it's a ring, but it's a vector space and it has a, has a basis given by Young diagrams. Yes. Um, so it has this basis of Young diagrams and there's these sort of uh, non-obvious ways <laughs> in those terms. They're not sort of annoyingly subtle ways of like multiplying young diagrams and then yes. also composing young diagrams, which is the plethism, yes. which is just composition of these uh, sure functors abstractly. Yes. It's very simple abstractly. Uh, uh, so, so one way to, so one way that people think about lambda rings is a sort of middle brow way to think about it. So, so a lambda ring would be a ring together with an, this type of action of, of, of lambda, of the plethora lambda on it. Uh, so, so I mean, this is like some, one of many definitions of, this is not the most concrete and it's not the most abstract. So like, a, so it's a ring. With an action. So, I mean, I'm seem to be getting sucked into saying more of this abstract stuff than I planned. <laughs> Probably because I spent so much time talking with uh -huh. Todd and Joe about this stuff. Um, right. So, so there are very concrete ways of which it sounds like you sort of know of saying what, what a lambda ring is. Um, what one, let's see. Yeah, I think I'll say a little bit about this. So, yeah, I'll say a little bit about this. You sort of know this maybe. So as a, so if you just think of it as a ring, you, the lambda, this has a sort of nice description. Um, it's the it's the free ring on a bunch of generators. And they call them like uh, lambda one, lambda two, and on forever. And so these guys, these are like the incarnations of the exterior power right? stations that you get. Uh, when you have a two rig, for example, so so if you got like a, you know this stuff, like if you got an object in your, in your two rig, then you can tensor with itself a bunch of times and then anti-symmetrize that product. You get this thing called the nth exterior product. And, and so you can, uh, you can, 
So, so at the level of the growth and D group, you have these operations called lambda ends. And it's a not, it's a not immediately obvious fact that, that lambda is free on the, all these guys, which is why I guess it was called a lambda ring. And this is probably, yeah, I mean, this is how they probably first thought about it somehow. Growth and Deke probably sort of knew that there are like all sorts of things you could do, like tensor stuff and mod out <laughs> by, you could symmetrize, you could anti-symmetrize, you could do all sorts of stuff. But for some reason, he knew enough that you could like latch onto these particular exterior powers and just think about, think about them uh, in the sense that, uh, when you know how all these operations act on a guy in a <laughs> in one of these abstractly defined lambda rings, then you know every sure functor or every every young diagram acts on it. Yeah. So so that that sort of semi concrete way of thinking about it, it's actually sort of handy for what what we're going to do what i'm going to do okay. um and in particular it's handy for like getting a sort of concrete understanding of this big wit ring but first let me give like a non a non concrete <laughs> explanation of the big wit ring which is sort of you seem to be uh talking about in your email so okay. so the point is that like we've got this category of lambda rings And then there's this category of just rings. And there's this obvious forgetful functor from lambda rings to rings. But the cool part that you mentioned is that it has both a left and a right adjoint. So it has this left adjoint, like L. Um, and then it has this right adjoint Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm forgetful here. And so, yeah, so like one of the things that I learned when I was <laughs> doing this project with Todd, which I, for some reason, hadn't known. Well, I mean, the obvious part is when you have this kind of string of adjunctions. Yes. You, you get a monad from going L and then U, but then you also get a co-monad when you go u and then background r yes and then i guess yeah it's also sort of obvious if you know about <laughs> composing left adjoints is a left adjoint composing right adjoints because a right adjoint i guess it's supposed to be obvious that that this monad uh doing l and then doing u so I'm writing in the textbook order. Uh, so that monad is left adjoint to the co-monad. Yes. So all that sort of, sort of easy formal yes. stuff. Um, but then what I hadn't known I'm not sure I still really know know it. Uh, is that when you're in this situation, uh, when you're in this type of situation, the maybe this is super obvious, but I haven't checked it. Why? So the the algebras of the monad are equivalent to the co-algebras of the co-monad. So Todd cites Eilenburg and Moore, I guess, for that, or is it probably Eilenburg and Moore. So it's like probably like one of the first papers on, uh -huh. on monads or something. Uh -huh. um, I guess that's just like, I haven't checked it. It sounds like it could be just like a formal sort of die easy kind of thing <laughs> i forget exactly but it's yeah it's it works out if you do it right yeah 
So, yeah, so, so, so that means, well, what, what does that mean? Um, well, <laughs> I guess there's another thing that I'm somehow slipping in here, which is, I guess, that this. Uh, <laughs> wait, 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 I'm getting, I'm getting confused about something here. Sure. What am I trying to say? Um, what am I trying to say here? Uh, Oh, okay, let's see, let's see, okay. So, um, Okay, so text, textbook order UL, okay, or chronological order LU, that is a, that should be a left adjoint monad. Yeah. On rings. Yes. And chronological order You are, yeah. I, I, that's what I want to know what you're worrying about because I'm 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 starting to worry about something and so like I'm trying to read your mind. Yeah. Um. Uh, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm. I'm just having some really basic confusion here. Uh. So. I mean, I want there to be a monad on the category of rings for which lambda rings are the algebras, but I also want there to be a co-monad. On the category of rings, for which lambda rings are the co algebras. Oh, maybe I'm doing something. Oh, you're, yeah, okay. I, I think I made a mistake. Yeah, I was starting to worry about, about whether that, that's, I want that too. But, but now I'm also confused. I, I screwed, I'm, I'm confused. Up. I screwed I'm up. I screwed up. I but, screwed up. But, yeah, there yeah, is I, this. I don't want. I don't want to talk about. I don't want to talk about a co-monad. I wonder if I screwed you up in email though. But go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I can blame you if you want, but I don't know. I I, I have to check. But, <laughs> but 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 I think. I think what we're trying to say here. Is that there's a co-monad. Let's see if this makes sense. There's a there's a co-monad on rings. Wait, this is yeah, yeah, this makes sense. Okay, yeah. I mean a monad can only be adjoint to a co-monad if they're on this same category, right? So because they're both endo functors. So so this co-monad yes. here is good has got to be the one where we do it's got to start rings, go to lambda rings, and then back. And here we're doing first, right. yeah. first doing a right adjoint and then doing this left adjoint. U is also a left adjoint. So yeah, so I had written that, yeah, that was screwed up there. And this, okay, this okay. solves. That's, that, that's helpful, okay, yeah. Yeah, this solves 
this solves our our problem that we were I was about to yeah. run into. You're right. So yeah. So this <laughs> so this uh, result of Eilenberg and Moore is that like on the same category here we have both the monad and a co-monad and the algebras. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so the algebras of one are equivalent to co-algebras of the other. And and it's it's the co-monad. approach that is called the big wit at the comonad is called the big wit comonad so so algebras okay of ul equivalent to coalgebras of the comonad Which is first R and then U. And this guy here, I'm just going to call it W. This is W here. And I'll just call it the big wit, big wit ring or big of a ring. Call like the big wit co-monad. So, so what is this? What what is this thing like? So, um, so say I've got a ring. Oh boy, well I, I can't call my ring R because I've got a right adjoint functor. Probably a will, probably almost a will call it R, but I guess. I guess just not to call it R, I'll call it A. So we've got some ring. And we, like, I want to know what is it like for this to be a, a lambda ring? And well, from this abstract nonsense, it's equipped with a, it's a co-algebra of this big wit ring uh, co-monad. So, that, so that's the abstract idea of what this W is supposed to be. So alpha ring is a lambda ring. If there's a ring homomorph, if there's a coaction, there's a ring homomorphism for starters. Um, but it's actually a, makes it a it makes it a coalgebra. Yeah, and so I guess. Um, I think, I think, I'm not sure this is true. Let's see. I think it's that if this, we just have this homomorphism here that we'd call A a pre-lambda ring these days. Um, I hope the same right. pre-lambda ring that you were talking about before? <laughs> I, I or think so. I'm just guessing actually. I mean, it's, yeah, I'm done. I mean that's what I'm saying, but I'm not sure it's true. Uh -huh. I don't. I don't need that fact now. I'm just sort of. Uh huh. I, but and then I, I then of course, but you could break up the land the rings idea into those two pieces, right? The the coaction and the and the sorry the, the map, and then that the map is a coaction. 
<laughs> I get. So what? Were you planning to break it up the for the? For the uh, I'm, I'm I'm really not sure. I'm really yeah. not sure. I'm anyway, to... this is luckily we don't need to know this stuff at all. I'm only, yeah. I only care about full fledged lambda rings, um, uh, and right now, <laughs> but okay. But I'm sort of getting tempted into thinking about how you can right. like take that idea and sort of chop it in half. Yeah. Um, but okay, so what I'm mainly, well, one thing I wanna do is I like wanna use this abstract characterization of what W is supposed to be doing for us and then use it to like get a more concrete description of what this big wit ring actually is. Um, I'm only going to do a little bit, I'm only going to do what I absolutely need to figure, uh, which is that I'm going to just describe what this W of A is like as an abelian group, as an abelian group. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you how to, the multiplication <laughs> works here, uh, so because I won't even need that. Do people think can, of, yeah. But of course you should be able to like just completely sort of grind it out, work it all out from this universal or from this fact here. Or what were you gonna say? Uh, just a cultural thing. I'm trying to, the, this terminology, big wit ring, does that tend to mean one specific thing or is it like a functor that changes? This is this functor is, so there's a big wit, big wit ring of a ring. Of, of a ring. There's, yeah. there's not a particular preferred one to think about. Um, there might the, be, but yeah. Not tremendously. People do, of course, like thinking about the case when A is Z, the integers. That's especially nice. But, okay. but they often, but they're really interested in the big wit ring of any old ring. And they all work sort of, in a somewhat uniform way so that it's uh we'll we'll see in a minute what the, what it looks like and then you'll see that it doesn't well it depends on a but in a sort of can, can, uh, can i just i i just want to throw in one yeah. thing you asked me about how i was proposing to split things in half i don't want to uh -huh. i don't want to put too much time on this but my vague idea was that when you have a plethora you can you know Take its underlying by ring. Uh huh. And that to me is sort of splitting in half. So, you know, you can talk about a, I'd have to, it would take me a long time to figure out exactly what I mean by this, but that's, that's my idea of what half a plethora is. Half a plethora is just a by ring. Um, and. Okay, I thought we were, but I think what people, that's fine. And, but yeah. I think it's connected because what mainly people talk about is like half a, half a thing on which the plethora acts, right? So like people talk like a special lambda ring, that's like a thing right, on which right. the plethora lambda acts, but sort of only halfway. Yeah, um, but I, so I, I, think, I, think, I think that's compatible because I think yeah. what it is is that, you know, being a lambda ring, that's sort of being a plethora morphism, whereas the half thing is just being a bi ring morphism. I'd have to check to see if that really all makes sense, but that's my vague right. attempt. I think that's that feels right to me. So, so like, what I think is that like, so la like in our example here, lambda is a bi ring and it's a plethora. Yes. Uh, so we could just ask that this is a ring map. Ring that, or bi ring or? Oh, sorry. Ring or bi ring or? Well, R is just a ring for starters. Oh well, I I, I kind of meant the currying. Uh, let's see. Well, okay. Well, let me just finish this. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. So, go ahead. So, I, so you can just treat lambda as a bi ring, and then you tensor with this ring. You get a, you get a ring. Uh, so, so tensor in this funny way. Uh, and so, so you could just ask that this is a ring map, and then I think R would be like a, a pre lambda ring. So maybe or you could ask that this is actually like a an action of the plethora lambda. 
and then I think it becomes a then yeah, becomes yeah, I mean, you might be right, but if so, maybe I said something more. I, again, I don't want to waste too much time on this, but yeah, uh, yeah I should go home and for homework, I should kind of straighten this out in my own mind. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I should too. <laughs> There's lots of lots of stuff that I haven't done. Um, so, okay. So, but what I wanted to do was notice that. So I have this. So suppose I do have a lambda ring here. Um, so I was persuade you that like, I know, sorry, let me just put it this way. Suppose I have a ring. Okay. And then I'm like trying to put a Lambda ring structure on it. So A is a, a, is a ring. So to put a lambda ring structure on it, I need to I need to tell you what I need to tell you what all these lambda operations do. So I need so I need a bunch of maps. Lambda N going from A to A. Then they need to obey some properties, but but I'm just like trying to figure out like what's the amount of structure I need to put on A to nail down its lambda ring structure. Yeah. So we've got all these maps. And so then what we can, so here's the trick that people do is they say, well, I'll take all these maps and I'll just think of it as I'll lump them all into one big fat map. Right. And so what I'll do is I'll make up this operation. I'll make up this thing where I'll, so like if you give me an, an element of the ring, I'll apply all these lambda ends to it. And then I want to like lump them all together into one big fat thing. So I'll make them be the coefficients of a formal power series. Right. So I'll, I'll cook up this thing. Uh, notice that, 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 well, this is sort of a little technical, but notice that these guys, um, the non-trivial ones of these guys started at uh, the first exterior power. The zeroth exterior power is like required to be the identity. So we don't like include that. Right. Like something that we get to pick. Um, right. And so actually what people often do for some stupid reason, which is not completely stupid, is they like write one plus this stuff. I mean, I, that's the same as saying that like lambda is zero is is the identity. So they look at this formal power series here. Yes. Um, so this thing, what it what it's in, it's it's an element in the formal power series with coefficients in our ring A, and with this formal variable T. So so the, so this so this. Um, so in other words, what we really, we're, we're taking all these maps, infinitely many maps, and we're lumping them into a single map. Right. That goes from A, the raw ring, to formal power series in A. Yes. And, and so we get this map. So we, we have this way of describing a lambda ring as a map from A, to to well to, to the formal power series that have this form that they start out with a one yes um and so that's so that is the big wit ring as a, that's the big wit ring as a as an abelian group that is so so we think of this as a map 
So, so what we say is we say, okay, so the big wit ring as a, uh, sorry, I'm not even really sorry, not even as an abelian group. Sorry, I'm really screwing up. Basically, just as a set. Yeah. So as a set, okay. It's the set of all these kind of. I kept saying abelian group several times in this conversation. Right. That was always wrong. So even the abelian group structure takes is not in like not a. It's like a non-trivial abelian group structure that you can't just like, I mean, this thing looks like a ring here. So you might think, oh, we're just gonna use that ring structure, but we All don't right. use that. We don't even use the abelian group structure of that. So we, so the big wit ring is just this thing as a set. And so it's just a, like a subset of the formal power series. But, but then the, the abstract nonsense lets us know that this that this big wit ring it really is a ring and so there has to be some way to add and multiply these things yes that's making it this set into a ring um so I'm, what i'm not going to do maybe unsatisfying or something. I mean, what I'm not going to do is like tell you the the ring structure on the big wit ring. I'm just telling right. you like the set structure on it. Okay. And the reason why I'm not going to tell you that is because it's a little bit it's a little bit annoying. So the the group right so the group structure had better be a structure that makes this map into a group homomorphism. Yes. And so that's about like, if I take A plus B and I stick it in here, yeah. what happens? And so basically what you're forced to confront is like, okay, what's the exterior power of a, of a sum of two things? Yes. And that's not too terrible. There's a sort of nice right. binomial coefficient type right. formula for the exterior power of the direct sum of two things. And if we decategorify that, that like gives us the, the group structure on, on the big wit ring. Okay. And then there's this like, and that's sort of, yeah. So that's like not so bad, <laughs> but then there's like this more annoying thing about the multiplication. Yeah. Where we, we want this to preserve the multiplication. So we got to like figure out what the hell the multiplication is in the big wit ring. And to figure it out, we need to like think about like what's the nth exterior power of a tensor product of two things, and how do you like ex re express that in terms of other exterior powers and products of other exterior? Uh, so anyway, that that so what ha one reason why like big wit rings like always put me off is because usually people just start right there. They just say like, the big wit ring is this set here. And I'm gonna tell you some weird way to add things in here. Uh -huh. And then some even weirder looking way to multiply things in here. Uh -huh. And that's how they define the big wit ring. Um, whereas my own approach to learning this is to like put off learning about that stuff as long as, as, long as possible. And and try to try to uh, get as much out of out of just these easy considerations. Yes. So that's what I'm going to do today. Okay. And I guess I'm sort of halfway there today. So so we know that when you have a lambda ring, it comes with a map from that. A, a ring homomorphism from that, from its underlying ring to this set here. Yes. Which is a, which is a ring, but we're not gonna worry too much about how it's a ring. Someone's just pulling into my driveway. And so I wanna know what sure. is, sorry, this may, I may wanna pause my. Sure, sure. I think I do. Yeah, I'm gonna pause it for a minute. Um, okay. Somebody's returning some stuff. To okay. Let's see if I can figure out how to pause.
pause the video help uh, okay <laughs> okay so so here comes the oh i made a little mistake um it's it'll no, I didn't. I was going to put it over n factorial here, but it, I don't need to because it's sort of in. It's like the usual okay. exterior power sort of already sort of modding out by a permutation group action, so it's sort of like it's in there. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So now here's the cool part. What does this have to do with zeta functions and such? So, yeah. Uh, okay. So one amazing thing is that one amazing thing is that there's this there's this way to turn any lambda ring into another lambda ring. And it comes, I think, from this fact that there's this, well, I don't, it's, it comes from something like this fact. There's this map from lambda to itself that sends, that's a, that's a ring homomorphism a ring isomorphism, automorphism, and it's really cool because what it does is it turns these exterior power yes. operations into symmetric power operations. Yes. yes. Uh, since you don't love Greek letters, I'll call it S, I guess. But it, well, I, <laughs> I'll call it S. But it's like the decategorified version of the symmetric tensor powers. And it's, and it turns S, and that, I mean, that's enough to define it because, because uh, lambda is like a free ring on these generators. So once I've told you where they go to, that, yes. that defines it. But then the cool part is that you can show that it, that it, sends Sn back to the lambda ends. Yes. And so that means that it's an involution. Yes. And that means that it's an automorphism. Uh, why, why does being an involution mean that it's an automorphism? What? Because it's its own inverse. Oh, as opposed to a homomorphism. Yeah, as opposed like to a mirror and endomorphism. Yeah, so it gets okay. to be a homomorphism just because we could send these lambda ends to anything and get a homomorphism. But sure, but but sort of. So in some sense, the miracle is that uh, yes. yes, if you do it twice, you get back what you started from. Yes. So it, so Todd has high Todd Trimble has high hopes for this thing because it sort of shows that like super symmetry is built into lambda in some sense like the symmetry some kind of bose fermi symmetry and that's yes. sort of cool it's partially yeah anyway it's 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 cool because uh one reason why it's cool is that like you could also define super sure functors you yes. could have like gone back to our own. You could have thought like, oh, to get supersymmetry into the game, maybe I should replace vector spaces with super vector spaces and then get some kind of super sure functors. Yeah. Um, but you could do, but it turns out that like the supersymmetry stuff is sort of already lurking in yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, so then, so I don't know if this, I don't, let's see, I don't quite know why this follows or so maybe, maybe it doesn't really follow, but, but, but I think what, 
one of the spin-offs of this is that if you have any lambda ring, you get a new lambda, it gets to be a new lambda ring where the new lambda operations were the S operations in your original lambda ring. Yes. So we get like, I mean, it should, it should be just some kind of abstract nonsense. But I'm a little conf I'm a little confused because, uh, like, like if I have a lambda ring, I mean, one way to think about it. Oh, well, maybe this maybe this is a better way to think about it. Sorry, one. Well, I don't know. I I'm, I'm not going to necessarily figure all this out right now. But but like one thing I said is like when you have when you have a lambda ring. Well, I I didn't quite say this. I I said the categorified version of this. When you have a lambda ring, you get a map from lambda to yes. functions of A. Yes. But then you can but then you can pre-compose with this yes. thing well. and get a new map. That's not supposed to be in A. <laughs> That's supposed to be lambda. Uh, you get a new a new map. Uh, that's supposed to be the, I mean, that, that there, there might be some property that you need to check or something. I'm a little confused about that, but, but I think it's true. So this, this gives a new, so, so if A was a Lambda ring, We get this new sort of super partner version of it. I mean, you're making it sound like there's a plethora involution here or something like that. I'm not sure that's right, but I, I'm, I'm not sure that's exactly, exactly the kind of that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm confused by. Like, like why should this thing be a why should this ring automorphism be a plethora automorphism? Do I need to check something else to check that that's true? Yeah, I I, I just don't know. Maybe it's obviously yes. Maybe it's obviously no. I just don't know. Yeah, I. I I think it's yes. Okay. I mean, if we need it, that's <laughs> right. I mean, if we need it to be a plethora automorphism, then it's it is one. Because uh -huh. uh, I just know that we get from talking to Dot that we get like a new lambda ring structure. Uh -huh. But I'm forgetting. I realize I'm like forgetting why it actually why it actually works. I mean, so this like shows you how to do it, but it doesn't show you that it yeah that it's gonna work. So. Yeah. I think I'm following your old dictum that like, as long as you nail down the structure, you can like hope that the properties work. Right, right. <laughs> so that's what that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing today here. So, um, so then, okay. So then, what's the point? So, well, so so if I have a lambda ring, one thing I can do is I can get this map from it to its uh, big wit ring. But, but now what I'm doing is I'm using this new lambda ring structure on it. Okay. Um, and so, So this new lambda ring structure looks more like more like an ordinary exponential function, right? Because this is this this is sort of morally 
this is sort of a morally like a to the n over n factorial. I mean, it's not a, it's not equal to a to the n over n factorial, which is, which is, uh, which is something that does make sense in your ring. But what I mean is that it's sort of like, yes, yeah, it, it's in cases when your lambda ring came from a two rig. Here, this is like the tensoring a with itself n times then modding out by the permutation group yeah I, i'm i'm not sure exactly how to interpret that but i see what you're saying yeah yeah well so we're going to do an example where we're going to now use this in some examples where a actually comes from a two rig so so that's the case that we really that i really that's the only case that i really care about yes uh, So I'm saying that like when R is a two yes. rig, when R is a two rig, we get this nice, we a two rig, we get this nice thing, which expresses how the growth and deep group of R is a lambda ring, and so it's K of ah. Sorry, they don't commute. It's from the growth and decay of R to the vial, sorry, to the <laughs> big wit ring of the growth and decay group of R. Okay. And so it's it's sending the class of any object to the class of this thing that's very much like the exponential of that object. In fact, I mean, so I'll just write it like that. So like you tensor that object n times, mod out by the action of the group n bang, and then stick this, well, <laughs> stick this T to the N in there. Sorry, probably to be honest, I guess. It's just uh, so like this, this is something in the K theory of R and this is like a formal power series of those kind of things. So, I mean, so the more point is that this is morally is more like the exponential of A, and some kind of exponential of A. Okay, so th so th so this is a so this is sort of cool that like the whole lambda ring structure of the growth and deep group of a two rig is captured by this map. Which is like an sending something to its exponential. Okay. And now the cool part is that this is actually one way to think about how zeta functions work. Namely, um, so, so sometimes you have a two rig. like the two rig of motives where for any object in it you get a a concept of the number of points in that object and so what do i mean by that what I mean, I guess, is that sometimes you have a way of assigning so so like okay, and what I mean really is just it's like sometimes you have a ring homomorphism uh, which I'm maybe gonna call like an N for like number of points. 
going from a going from a the growth and group of a two rig to the integers. So for example, like if we were doing like motives over a finite field. So for varieties over a finite field, I just mean like the number, you could take the number of points in that variety defined over that finite field. Uh, but then, but motives, motives are sort of built up out of varieties by a kind of, uh, by, by, well, by various processes that we've talked about. Yes. And, th and those various processes sort of allow you to, at each stage, still continue to define a concept of the number of points. But it could be negative now, uh, but it's still going to be an integer. So, I mean, crudely, you can think of motives as something like formal differences of varieties. That's a little sure, slow. sure. But I, I'm just I'm mm, sorry. I'm, did I miss something? I'm confused about this. These points that you're talking about. Um, when did you start talking about points? I think that's about where I started getting confused. Um, so, I, what I'm so my, my like a, so formally, what I'm saying is that like sometimes. R is a two, you have rig. a two rig. You have yeah. a ring homomorphism like this. Sometimes, for some two rigs, you get a you get a ring homomorphism like this. And I think that's all I need to say if I was trying to be like abstract. All right. Can I think about this? Can I think about this? Can I think yep. about this? A, a, a ring homomorphism like this. Let me just maybe, I'll call this, maybe I'll call this thing with just like a number sign. I think I sort of like that. Pound sign. So, I mean, so you may remember, like I said, like we're not really going to need anything much in particular about motives to do this stuff I want to do. Um, and so so we don't really need to know what motives are. We just need to know that there are some two rigs that come with a homomorphism like this. But, but I mean, to make it interesting, it's a fact that like if you do motives over a finite field, a particular finite field, then there is, if that's our R, then there is indeed a ring homomorphism like this. I mean, there is a specific ring homomorphism and, and the way you get it, and it has the property anyway, that, that when your motive is actually a variety that it's counting the number of points of that variety. So I sort of want to think of this sort of abstractly as being like a number of points, a way to count points. But, but we're doing this, um... All right. At the moment, we're still just supposing that we have this number sign thing yep. on some particular R. But okay, but you're trying to tell me about you're, you're trying to motivate this with certain examples of particular R. Yep. And so, what's your example of particular R? Um, um, the primo example, primo example is like motives over a specific finite field. Let me think about that for a moment. So that's supposed to be like a an absolute two rig. Yeah. So for so for Okay, so you really do need this to be turns into a, a co-product. 
sorry, we, did is it we, were you thinking for a long time there, or did the audio blank out? The audio blanked out for a minute. Okay. So I was saying that like there are various flavors of motives. Uh, for example, choosing motives involves picking a kind of uh, adequate equivalence relation on divisors. But 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 one but for all of these kinds of motives, one step is basically amounts to taking the category of whatever varieties you're looking at and Cauchy completing it. So that part, and then the product of varieties makes the category of motives be symmetric monoidal or it leads to a symmetric monoidal structure on the motives. And then the, uh, the way that you but I'm also getting I'm also getting confused. There was something about the field of coefficients when you're defining motives or something like that. Yeah, there's a choice of a field of coefficients. And you want that to be characteristic zero? Yeah, let's take it to be like the rationals or something of character anything of characteristic zero. The reason why characteristic zero came in, I guess you may know already, is that um, the whole theory of sure functors changes in non-zero characteristic. There get to be like other, uh, you know, like anti-symmetrization. You, you gotta be, well, I think you like get additional sure functors over fields of non-characteristic, of characteristic non-zero, but we're, I don't wanna think about those. Yeah, I don't wonder about that. Could yeah, be something so. interesting, but I don't wanna yeah. look at it. Yeah, so our um, field of definition is is a finite field, but the coefficient field, just something of characteristic zero. Yeah, just like the rationals or the algebraic completion of the rationals or something. So for either of those choices, you get this kind of uh, counting points ring homomorphism. I probably should have some intuition about what this number sign thing is, but um, uh, so far I have a very limited intuition about it, but okay, maybe you should go ahead and, and I'll, I'll- Yeah, I'm almost done. Okay. There, are, okay. there are lots of things to say about this, I guess. I mean, one buzzword I'll just breathe is that like when people talk about counting points in this context, they also talk about like the trace of the Frobenius or the super trace of the Frobenius. Well, actually, okay, wait, 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 wait. Let, me, let me think. Let me, let me, actually, let me, let, me, let me try to think a little bit of Because you're talking about points over a finite field. Sorry, you're talking about points of a variety. Uh, sorry, I'm getting to I mean like global points of variety. Of, or yeah, closed points. points uh huh. Points of a variety over a over some particular finite field. Okay, keep keep going. I'm again. I'm something's various things are bugging me, but I can't quite say uh -huh. out loud what they are. So go, keep going. Okay. So so here's a way that we here's a way to here's a cool way to get a zeta function. Yeah. Which matches known zeta functions for for these varieties over finite fields. Okay. So the way it works is we since since this growth and deep group of motives is a lambda ring, it it comes with this map to the to the big wit ring. Yes. And the one I want to use 
I mean, it comes with two, <laughs> but yeah, the one I wanna use is the one that is using the sum of uh, symmetric powers. Okay. Just write that like that in symmetric powers. Sorry. So. <laughs> so this, this is the co algebra structure for one of these. Lambda right. Structures. This is the expressing the lambda ring as being a co-algebra of the big wit co-monad. Yes. Uh -huh. yes. And then we can follow that by this counting points thing. But, but W is a functor, so we can do W of counting points. So it goes to W, the big wit ring of Z. So the big wit ring of Z is just like a special case where the where our coefficients are. Oh, it's, it's just a special case of this thing. So so anyway, so what it what it does is it says. Oh boy, sorry. Um, maybe that tech. Um, so what it says is just count the points in this nth symmetric power of A and stick it T to the N after it formally. So that's, so it turns out, now this is a surprise to me, this came as a big surprise to me that this, that this is actually a the ordinary zeta function of a variety over a finite field. So the, the normal way you think of one normal way you think about a zeta function over a finite field is you like take the number of points defined over that finite field, but then you also take, keep track of the number of points defined over all the ex finite extensions of that finite field. So, and you sort of take all those numbers of points and you like package them into some, into some, uh, yeah, into some, well, if you're working over a specific finite field, you into some power series. Yeah. Um, but it turns out that that business is the is the same as this business. Um, so, in other words, like like say I'd like I had a variety defined over F three, and then I might like. I could talk, I could count the number of points defined over F3, but then I could like count the number of points over F9 yes. and so on. Yes. Um, so I don't know how to, <laughs> I'm just sort of writing these things for fun. Uh, yes. Well, the other thing I could do is I could take that variety, say like X, or here I'm calling it A, actually, it's just the same thing that I'm talking about. Uh, and I could take its symmetric powers. That's a thing, that's a thing you can do. So in other words, I look at that same variety and I take it symmetric square where I just take that variety times itself and then mod out by 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 the interchange of coordinates 
And I could count the number of points of that over F3. And I'm pretty sure, unless I'm really confused, <laughs> that that's the same as the number of points over F9. <laughs> I could be confused because it seems sort of amazing now that I say it this way, but I think that that's true. Um, I think I could argue for that, but I think that would take a while. Um, well, I'm really confused. Know, I'm really confused about that. I'm not quite. Yeah, it's so. So to argue for that, the way that I could argue for that is has to do with it would it would have to do with how. Um, It would have to do with how the number of points over these uh, various extensions. Yeah. You you could think of them. You could you could think of your variety as as being defined over the algebraic closure of F three. Right. And that has this Frobenius on right. it. Right. And then the fixed points of like the nth power of the Frobenius is like the number of points of the variety defined over the like the nth uh, extension yes. of your field. Yes, something like that, yeah. Yeah. And so so what it really so when you think about it that way what we're doing is we're like counting the number of fixed points of the nth power of some map. Yeah. Um, but there's a way, there's a way to re-express that as, there's a way to express that in terms of, in terms of like keeping track of orbits of that map. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then there's a sorry, and then there's a way to like think of the orbits of a map, yeah, as points in a symmetric power of of your set. So that is like sorry, that's so like mm -hmm. orbits of length n. In a set, <laughs> sorry, well, orbits. You have it like an, an endomorphism of a set, and you're like looking at the orbits of the nth. Sorry, you're looking at orbits of length n. You can also think of those as certain points in the nth symmetric power of that set, because they're just like wait, ah, sorry, that's probably screwed up. I've no, they're like cyclic. Sorry, they're not. They're not, right. yeah, sorry, they're cyclic. But I would have to do this more slowly and carefully right. to do it. I actually wrote a bunch of stuff once where I was like comparing, it, it's all sort of simple combinatoric stuff, but it's like when you've got like a, a set with an endomorphism on it, you can like try to count the fixed points of the nth power, Right, there's or something like that. Like orbits of different lengths and so on. And different formulas for zeta functions that people use, different like equivalent formulas for zeta functions. Basically the equivalence of them boils down to like showing that, that there are these relations between those various things I listed. Anyway, so I'm not ready. I can't do that now, I guess. I'm not just not up to it. Uh, but but uh, but I'm pretty damn sure that this winds up being the same thing as like the usual zeta function re-expressed in this funky way. 
because I've read it a couple of places and I think on a really good day, I could do the argument. Well, I'm really unsure about this last part, but I, I'm, I'm getting a lot of, out of the part, out of the discussion up to then. So, you know, I have to go home and think about this. Um, yeah. So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, so. <laughs> yeah, so, on for, well, okay. So it sort of fell apart at the end there, but, but the neat thing is that like, I mean, even if you don't believe that, <laughs> there's this very nice way to take a, an object in a two rig and get this formal power series from it. It's, and um, let's see. So this first thing is a ring homomorphism. And the second thing is a ring homomorphism too. Uh, so this is a ring, so this is a ring homomorphism. Yes. And, and that means that we like, well, if you believe that this composite is some kind of zeta function like thingy, yeah. <laughs> then, we, then it means that we like know stuff about like the zeta function of a sum or a product of right, objects. Right, right, um, and, and and people do and so I mean I, so uh, but the but the but what but, but it's not super obvious because the the addition and multiplication in this big wet ring is like some sort of complicated formula for for it yes so so we get some formulas that are not so obvious about about how this thing goes along with the uh, sums and products which I, is nice I think. Uh-huh. Um, and so people have, yeah, so people have looked at this and they've like looked at um, saying like, well, like suppose you don't use, suppose you don't do this map mapping down to W of Z, which is like some kind of simplification procedure where you're replacing yes. the object by its number of points. Yes. So they could just so so there's an idea uh, which seems to go back to Kapranov of of a motivic zeta function, which is like supposed to be like a super duper zeta function. And what it really is is well, he has his own favorite two rig of motives R, which I don't want to talk about, which I don't okay. especially like, but the idea of the motivic zeta function is you just do this map here. Uh -huh. you don't do the later simplification stuff. Yes. So that seems like a very beautiful idea to me because it's just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's really, I mean, it has this nice sort of exponential flavor to it, but what it really just is, is it's just like an expression of the fact that your category of motives or whatever it is is a is a two rig, or or in other words, that it's uh, growth and deep group is a lambda ring. Uh -huh. So, so it made me feel that this uh, big wit ring idea is uh, is like a way to capture some essence of zeta function this in a, in a sort of explain <laughs> like maybe like explain why zeta functions are interesting uh -huh. so that's the idea okay i see i ate up almost all the time well that's okay that's okay what time is it it's 3 20. 3 20. yeah yeah that's that's okay um I'm just trying to think whether I have any semi-intelligent questions to ask at this point. Um, I may have to go home and think about it before I come up with any questions. Um, just going through my notes here, this thing. I have a, yeah, I have a few questions for myself. 
Are you going to say them out loud or? Yeah, I might as well. Just okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Immortalize them. Uh, so, 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 let's see. Uh, right, so. Oh, well, okay. So like just one thing I should just like, I should just like figure out why when you have a left that joint monad, why the algebras, the category of algebras of the monad is equivalent to the category of co-algebras of the co-monad. Yeah, I don't have the answer right at my fingertips, but I suspect it's gonna work out very nicely. I mean, let me just give, let me state one idea here, which I hope is a correct, I hope, I hope it's actually true. Um, which, I think might be an ingredient in understanding how this all, how all this works. So what am I trying to say here? Is this right that whenever you have a by category, you can take a new by category where the objects haven't changed basically, um, but the new morphisms are the old adjunctions. <clears throat> uh-huh. And then you could ask, what are the adjunctions in that new mm -hmm. my category? Uh, Do you know the answer to that? I think uh, I know the answer. Yeah. I don't know. No, I don't know. I think the adjunctions in the new by category are the length three strings of adjoints. So if you have like, you know, A has a left adjoint B and then B has a left adjoint C, you can think of that as being, you know, you've got this adjunction between B and C and it has a left adjoint, which is the adjunction between A and B. So like, can I just? Uh, uh -huh. So there are three objects in that diagram. You mean yeah. and objects? <laughs> two morphisms. Well, I was thinking that you said what were a. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Uh, no, I just meant that. Um, I just had two objects, maybe x and y, or something like that. I wasn't oh, even sorry. thinking about that. I'm I was sorry. just making the objects anonymous. I was just saying- Okay, sorry. Oh, the same number. Okay. Okay, sorry, I was being stupid. Yeah, okay, uh-huh. So- I mean, let me see, let me see if I can steal- Yeah, the, I don't know why I said that. Yeah, that's dumb, but yeah, okay, I get it now. I was wondering how you got up to three, but yeah, I see. All right, it, see, it seems, to be, it seems to be letting me steal the, the screen here, okay? I'm gonna go ahead and- Sure, okay, yep. screen, Just wrong. All right. Okay, you can see my notebook now? Yep. So I've got some sort of, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I'm totally, now I'm totally screwing up the technical thing here. Um, okay, uh, so over here, I was trying to draw a picture of um, this functor U that has a left adjoint L and a right adjoint R. Mm -hmm. And then I was trying to draw a picture over here where you can see that, what am I trying to say? that, well, this was something about the left edge like monad and the right edge like co-monad or something like that. What am I trying to say? That um, I mean, if you've got the new by category where a morphism is an adjunction like L and U.
then if you have a right adjoint to that, it would be like, am I doing this right? So you, I don't know what does this work in terms of, I, I just can't figure out how to do it typographically or let's see. Um, I'm trying to say we have, I mean, this, this is what I'm calling a length three string of adjunctions. We have R and then it has a left adjoint U and then it has a left adjoint L. Yep. And I'm trying to say that LU is like a left adjoint adjunction to this other, to this right adjoint adjunction, U R. Uh huh. Is that working? Let's see. What am I trying to say? I mean, I think it works out very easily, but yeah, maybe, maybe this is all another exercise that I might have to go home and think about. Yeah, no, that's but, cool, but it could help. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I want to grab the screen and- Sure, sure. Some... Take, the, take the screen back. Okay, I want to ask some more- Okay, go ahead. Questions, I hope I still, yeah, okay, here I am. Okay, okay. Okay, so that was one, that sort of bunch of stuff. Okay. Um, 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 just, yeah, okay, so another one we were like thinking about was different possible ways of taking the concept of lambda ring and splitting off this sub-concept of pre-lambda ring. Yes, yes possibly just making this be like a map instead of a co-algebra or possibly making this just be a map instead of a action. Yeah, I really should know the answers to this, but again, I'm not quite, I don't have it clear in my mind yet. Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, yeah. so, and then, and then also there's like very old fashioned concrete definitions of lambda ring yes which involve different properties that these lambda yes. operations are supposed to obey and so yes yes seeing how those i mean seeing how those definitions of lambda ring and free lambda ring match these more abstract ones just getting it to work out would be nice right i'm listing a right. bunch of things right. that i like i feel would be fun to do, but I or the <laughs> reason why I haven't done them is that the type of things that I tend to not do. Uh, uh huh. Uh huh. So, and then yeah, so like another one is like figuring out like why this. Well, one thing that I didn't talk about, which I talked about with Todd, is like why is it true that this thing is an involution? Why, why when you apply it to it? To SN, you get back to lambda n. I've, I've seen Todd has a nice argument for that, but I don't feel like I really have internalized it. Well, I have a vague idea. Can I suggest the vague idea? Uh huh. That um, I mean, I'm sort of thinking of it in a categorified way, uh, but maybe this maybe this works out in a decategorified way too. That in a sense, what's this letter that you're calling it? Is that a W or something? Yeah, Omega, yeah. Omega. Um, yeah. In, in some sense, I'm just think of Omega as the converse operation on Young diagrams. Yes. Which is, yeah, obvious, is, that. Which is morally obviously an involution. Yes, I mean, if you can show that it's that, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, I mean, it, that's right. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not saying that's going to completely answer your question, but I'm saying that that's one way to think about it. Yeah, another way to think about it, I guess, is that like if you have a two rig, yeah, you can get a new two rig by the redefining the symmetry, and I think you just redefine the symmetry by sticking an extra minus sign in there. I could be getting mixed up. I think that's what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah, you can always do that, right? You can just. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. Uh, I 
again, Todd and I did talk about some things like this sometimes. I mean, this, what am I trying to say that if you just take the category of sure functors, you know, that has its omega, that's the, the converse uh -huh. of a sure functor. And if I remember correctly, that turns out to be a monoidal functor, you know, a monoidal equivalence, but I think it's not a symmetric monoidal equivalence. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah, I, yeah, Todd has explained that to me and I sort of understand that. That's not, but I mean, I was just suggesting that like, is that, yeah. is that supposed to like prove that what I said, I was saying I, that like- <laughs> I don't know, I can't remember. I, I just remember we, we had some fun thinking about some of this stuff, but I don't remember exactly what. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, was don't, I don't think, I don't think like we, we didn't reach a, we didn't reach perfect conclusions yet, but there was a lot of fun stuff going on. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so getting that sorted out would be nice. And then, yes, then part of it was like understanding better why or even whether <laughs> a lambda ring automatically gives you a new lambda ring by, by this somehow using in, in such a way that the the uh, action of sure functors gets replaced by the action of the converse sure functors. I'm pretty sure that's true, but uh, uh -huh. I, don't, I I'm sort of don't understand completely why it's true. Uh -huh. uh, that's another one. Um, right. So another one was like figuring out the. Maybe I already said this. Figuring right, I mean, out I mean the, one of, I, I'm vaguely remembering one of the things that various other things that Todd and I talked about. And I mean, some of them are just, you know, really obvious and things. I mean, if you just think of, you know, sure functors as representations of this groupoid of finite sets, then, you know, cardinality by cardinality of the finite set, that's just, that converse operation is just tensoring with the sign representation. Right. I don't remember what that means, but uh -huh. that must yeah. be some sort of ingredient in seeing the whole picture of what Omega is doing. Yeah, I think Todd could say tons yeah. of stuff about this. Uh, yeah. I yeah. learned most of that stuff from him and then- Yeah, yeah. 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 So then another thing is just like, maybe like for my sake, sometime trying to understand addition and multiplication in this big wit ring, which is like what I was sidestepping. People presented in a very dry way. They use this term ghost vectors. Uh, I mean, I really just want this. I, can I do this? I just want to start out by defining the big bit ring as this co-free thing, and then use that as my definition, and then somehow conceptually grind out the, the concrete answer, concrete description of what, what it actually is in particular cases, like if A is the integer or something like that. Is that going to take me a long time to do? Is that going to work? I think it will work. Yeah. And I think you will... It, that exercise, I think it's sort of similar to figuring out the definition of a lambda ring as in terms of a bunch of lambda operations obeying some properties and figuring out exactly what those properties are, namely how the lambda operations get along with a, sums and products in your ring. I think that's like a similar, I think it's like the same thing seen in a different seen from this right adjoint co-monad approach instead of the left adjoint monad approach. You know, I'm realizing that there's, a, there's actually a whole bunch of questions, right, now, now I'm realizing there's a whole bunch of questions I do have about this stuff that, that we don't have time for today. Even if I'd remembered them earlier, we still wouldn't have time for them today. Because... Um, <laughs> time to ask them or time? Yeah, yeah, wouldn't even have time to ask them, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Okay, well, you can email me them or I'm happy to talk about them at some point. I mean, it has to do with this idea that, what am I trying to say that,
I want to say something like, let's see. Well, it right. So I, I really don't even know how to ask these questions, but it's something like you can say that being a lambda ring is part of being a Hopf algebra. I'm not quite sure whether it's say part of being a bicommutative Hopf algebra or part of being a commutative Hopf algebra. I'm not quite sure which I should say. Like, there might be more than one of those things to say that and they both work or something like that. But um, but it's something like that. I mean, any, right, I, I, right, I get confused about whether I should be, if I should be saying commutative hop algebra, should I say commutative hop algebra or co-commutative hop algebra, but it's something like that. There's something like, uh, Part, part Are you saying of, that any hop algebra of whatever sort is a lambda ring? Yes. Yes. I, I'm, I, I'm not sure I said it exactly right yet. I might think you have it backwards or something like that. It might be. But something like that is true. Hmm. And it's. I, I want to say something like that. I'll, I'll have to think about it and, and okay. ask the questions later. But it's something like, uh, it, what am I trying to say? That uh, I mean, I'd like to say something like that being a lambda algebra is exactly the plethory part or the plethory aspect of being a, a Hopf algebra. So like there is no plethory whose algebras or models or whatever are the Hopf algebras. Let's see, I guess we're right. We're, so, okay. So I guess these would have to be commutative hop algebras. We're working on a base of commutative rings. So at the very least, these should be commutative hop algebras. But now I'm not sure whether they should be bi-commutative or just commutative hop algebras. But... Um, Can you say how you do a lambda operation to a guy in... One of these kind of commutative hop algebras or whatever they are? Or do you have some other way of seeing why that? <laughs> on, on a good day, I could. I'm just not sure it's a good day. Yeah. Um, okay. Oh, we don't. Yeah. No, it sounds really cool to me. It's weird. I didn't know about that. Um, well, but uh, it reminds I'm, I'm, me I'm, of not, I'm, 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 not, I'm not completely buying the idea that you didn't know, know about that. I mean, I think that's. I think at some point I could try to convince you that you, you know, secretly did already sort of know something like that. But I, I but again, in order to know it, yes, it first has to be true. And I'm not sure I said it exactly correctly yet. Something uh -huh. like that is true. I mean, I mean, it has to do with the idea that, what am I trying to say? That a group ring, is it a group mm -hmm. ring or an, so uh, the group ring of an abelian, let's, yeah, let's keep it simple for a moment. The group ring of an abelian, that becomes a lambda algebra in some very straightforward way. How does that, what's confusing to me is that it becomes a, uh, does it become a, no, I don't know. I mean, it, I mean, again, so being, it, okay, being, well, being the group ring of an abelian group that has a lot to do with being like a bicommutative hot algebra or something. Yeah, at least you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I still don't get where the lambda operations, or maybe that's maybe thinking in terms of lambda operations is not the easiest way to get your hands on it. But I don't get where the lambda. That's true. That's true. If, if, if this is right, this is one of those cases. 
ah, right, okay. I think you're kind of giving part of giving away part of the hint that <laughs> you know there's this atoms operation viewpoint, and okay. the atoms operations are much more manifest in that groupering of a, for example, I mean, maybe okay. but groupering of an abelian group certainly would be sufficient. Um, okay, so then there's this operation where you where the multiplication by n on the group does gives you a map on the group ring and that's an atoms operation yeah i think i think that's yeah yeah it. but i i don't think I, I can't say much more intelligence about this today, no but, but, you, the, but, but there, there is a lot of intelligent stuff to say about it, and i just can't say any of the intelligent stuff today um there's a bunch of yeah i don't has a lot to do with thinking about characters of representations of yeah, finite groups. And yeah, okay, stuff. it's starting to make sense to me. There's a bunch of stuff about that, by the way, in this paper by Tall and Wraith on, on. Yeah, I mean, Terrell and Wraith certainly. And there's the Tall Wraith. I mean, I have, I, I make, I, I don't want to make it sound like I've actually read that paper, but I just know that there are these things called Tall Wraith monads, mo, Tall Wraith monoids, of which yeah. plethories are, the most famous. They're basically example. the same as. I thought they were the most famous example, but I don't. Yeah, yeah. Plethories are the most famous example. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, Todd and I and Joe call talk about like M plethories for any monad M. And then like for the monad of commutative rings, that's like the traditional plethories. But but M plethories are what are the Sorry, M by M M by algebras are the thing are the same as these tall wraith monoids. Wait, no, never. Sorry, no, no. Tall wraith monoids are actually the <laughs> M plethories. Yeah, they have this. They're monoids in M by right, 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 yeah. right. But yeah, but they also. But the reason why I brought them up now is because they have this. Uh, actually, Joe is trying to write a paper about atoms operations, and and they have this stuff about how uh, about atoms operations in uh, a general concept of atoms, a more general concept of atoms operation, and yeah. So anyway, it's it's. I think that they do sort of. Show the thing you're saying, <laughs> you're trying to allude to. Yes, yes, anyway, yes, yes. All that stuff is neat, but I never really, yes, I never really got any into thinking about that. So, okay, okay, okay. Um, was there more stuff you were going to say here? Nope. So, um, yeah, I really want to tell oh, you. Well, stuff. there was. There was. You there actually was. Go ahead. Go ahead. There's go just ahead. the last yeah. question, which is just like, yes. This is like maybe the most exciting one for me. It's like, yes. get myself to be able to explain to you why this map here I'm talking about, why it deserves to be called a zeta function. So, like, should, yeah. why it matches some other thing that you would recognize as a zeta function. All right. But I'm still. So much suspicious and very lost about this. I mean, it does remind me, I, it sounds to me like you are alluding to something that, I mean, I can imagine all sorts of different directions in which you might try to generalize or not generalize concepts of zeta function, but there certainly are people who talk about, right, dynamical systems and fixed points and stuff like that. Um, and it sounds like you're heading in some direction vaguely like that. That's the way that I like to because I've spent some time, I talked about the zeta function of a Z set once as I, like a very general kind of zeta function. Right, right, I certainly buy that, I certainly buy that. And then I, and then I- I'm just, I'm just confused about where, I'm just, I'm just confused for, about to what extent I can see that in here. I'm not, Well, I might just not be seeing it the right way. No, oh, sorry, but go ahead, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, anyway, I used, I think I could use that kind of stuff, that kind of way of thinking to, argue that this matches some other better known ways of defining zeta function. 
anyway, but I should, that's the one I most want to do of all these chores that I've outlined for myself. Yeah, I don't understand that one, but I'm very, I'm very, I'm very interested to try to learn it if it, if it does make sense. <laughs> yeah. So anyway. Okay. That, that's anything else for today? That's pretty much it. That's it, I guess. I Yep. Okay. So thanks a lot. I do really want to tell you about the, the sand font, whatever it's called, the children's drawings. I want to show you a bunch of pictures and stuff of that next time we get a chance. Okay. Yeah. Well, next next time we can do that. Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay. See ya. I'll see you. Yeah.